Hi, this is Ben with Novolux Stereophonic, and today in front of us I have yet another KLH project. This is a pair of Model 5 speakers, and this specific model I have a little bit of nostalgia for. The KLH Model 5 was one of the first decent quality vintage speakers that I owned, and I actually used a pair in my main system for many, many years. I have experience rebuilding the crossovers, refinishing cabinets, repairing drivers. I've kind of seen it all on these, so I thought it'd be a cool opportunity now that I have another set in the shop to go over a KLH5 restoration from start to finish. So if that sounds cool, stick around. Okay, to get started, I'm going to pull the grills off of each of these so we can get a look at the drivers. So I'm just going to be using a uh, right angle pick tool to pull the grill off. You can also use one with a hook if, if that's what you have on hand. Just really any thin, sharp object so that you can get uh, a grip into the, into the actual uh, cloth behind the frame and give it a tug. So these are just secured on with Velcro. So I'm just going to take this pick and kind of get it behind here just enough that I can softly pull to start releasing the Velcro. And you want to be careful not to pull this quickly or with too much force or you might snap the, um, the actual frame. So I believe there's two pieces of Velcro at the top, two in the middle and two in the bottom. So I'm just going to slowly release that Velcro. And there's the grill. So six individual tie points. And what can happen sometimes is you'll get a crack here and it's kind of hard to reinforce this. It's made out of like a, almost like an old pegboard material. All right, let's pop the other one off. Okay, so this is the typical configuration. We have a tweeter here, two mid-ranges, and these are inside of their own enclosure, and then the woofer. This is an acoustic suspension design, so when these are set up properly, there should be a little bit of a delay in this driver coming back. So this is, this is kind of pushing back without really much um, resistance at all. So the cabinet is probably not completely sealed. Usually what that means is this surround needs to get treated because air is leaking through. This is a uh, like a cloth surround. Now, weirdly on these, we have a number five on here, and then it says 25.7, and that one says 249.5. I'm not sure if that's something to do with a, um, a measurement. Maybe it's 5.7 ohms, 4.9 no, ohms, something like that. So once I uh, pull these out, I'm gonna do some testing. I'll figure out maybe why that stuff's written on here. It's possible that in the past, somebody, um, bought a pair of drivers on eBay to make a set complete or something. There's also some, some writing up here. Let's spin these around, take a look at the crossovers. So the KLH5 has two different versions for the crossover. I, I haven't worked on these in a long time, but I'm pretty sure these are gonna be the point-to-point -point version. So once we pull the woofer, we'll see if these are point-to-point -point or, or the PCB version. Um, mine are missing the thumb screws, so I'm going to zoom into one of these and show you what the terminals look like on these and how to fix it if you're missing that part. Looking at the back of the crossover plate, we have two terminals here. This one says ground and this one says 8 ohm, so when you're connecting this, usually you'd put your black or negative connection to ground and the plus or positive to 8 ohms. This is just an 832 bolt, so it accepts a 832 thumb screw, which looks like this. So I have a stash of these laying around, so I'm gonna have no problem making this set complete. That's what it looks like with a thumb screw installed. So this can take a bare wire, a spade lug, um, a ring terminal, anything like that. And then these two knobs here are this uh, like rooster head style knob. I think this is very similar to what's used on Macintosh. When I pull this off, we'll look and see if there's any writing on it. My guess is it's an early American made uh, knob that's probably fairly generic, so hopefully we can find out where to get these replacements if they're missing. The next step for these KLH5s is going to be feeding an audio signal through through them and uh, seeing if all the drivers work. So usually what happens is as these age, this tweeter is going to stop working. And it's usually not because the tweeter fails, it's because the crossover components have failed. So um, to do that, I'm going to hook up to the speaker terminals back here, and I've added, in addition to the thumb screws, I've added some uh, spade to banana terminal. So this is a good way to adapt a vintage speaker. You don't need to go in there and put in five-way binding posts. You can just use little adapters like this if you want to switch it out to banana. So I'm going to hook that up to my bench amplifier here and feed some test signals through and we'll see if these drivers are working. 
Got the speaker flipped down on its side here at the bench so that we can see the amplifier and the signal generator. Now this can be done with a music signal as well and sometimes it helps with a like a little paper towel or, or toilet paper tube with your ear up against it and pointing at the driver just to make sure that you're hearing frequencies from each one of them. I'm just going to do a frequency sweep here and if the crossover and drivers are working properly we should hear all the way up to, um, to around 17, 18 kilohertz. So right now I have 100 hertz going. So we hear that coming out of the woofer. I'm just going to ramp up the signal in 100 hertz increments. So that's now one kilohertz. Now I'm gonna ramp up one kilohertz at a time. Just turn it down a little bit. It's gonna get louder as we go up. So right now most of the sound is still coming out of the woofer. And now I can hear it shift over. So now it's more in the mid range section here. I can still hear it there at 16 kilohertz, but that's about the limit of my hearing, and I'm not sure exactly what these speakers are capable of. So, you know, now I'm up at 19, 20 kilohertz, I can't really hear anything. So I'm not quite sure if this top tweeter is working, but we'll find out when we pull it out, we'll do an individual test of that driver. The next objective here is going to be pulling this woofer so that we can get a look at the crossover and um, test this tweeter individually. Now you can use a drill for this, but for me, I think it's just too easy to slip and, and puncture the driver. You have a little bit less control, so I prefer to use a ratcheting screwdriver. So I'm just gonna go around and remove all these screws. Okay, all the screws are out. Now, sometimes you can use a pick tool and kind of grab the driver and get it out, but I'm just gonna try to dump it out here. See if that works. There is a little bit of a gasket in here, so I'm probably not gonna be able to do that. I'm just gonna grab a pick tool and we'll try that. So what I'm gonna try to do here is break the seal with a pick and then let gravity do the rest. So I'm just going to be using a 90 degree pick tool here and I'm just going to get inside of one of the, the holes from the screws and see if I can, Well, oh, it's in there pretty tight. Okay, I can hear it starting to come out. I just gotta be careful I don't slip because I could shove this pick tool through my thumb or damage the, the driver or the cabinet. That does not wanna come out. Let me try a different location. I can feel it starting to come. Here it comes. Okay, I think it's pretty loose now. Just got to hold down here so they can dump it out. Here we go. All right. So this corrosion seems to be typical on these and I will just end up wiping that up. I've seen two versions on this. This is round. Some of these have square magnets on them. All right, with the driver out, you might be tempted to desolder this here, but these are connected with some little blue um, wire nuts. So I just want to make sure that I can see the colors that these are attached to first before I pull them out. Looks like blacks are tied together. Let me get a better angle in there. All right, let's get some light on the situation here. Okay. So back behind here, there's a uh, set of wires that's going to the crossover. I've already pulled the, the little black wire nut off of this. So the red wire is going to the red wire and the black one was tied in with this set of three here. So I'm just gonna make a note of that and take some pictures and then I will kind of undo this twist and then I can pull this woofer out. Now that the woofer is pulled, we can see this material here. It's almost like a clay and I can't remember if this is original or not. I might have to go back and check some, check some of my pictures, but um, we can do a, uh, a more conventional gasket on here if we want, or I'll just put in some new weather stripping or something like that when we replace the woofer. All right, when I pull out this material, this is just like a cheese, cheese cloth for the woofer. So I'm just gonna pull that out and then there'll be some insulation. If you're sensitive to this, you might wanna wear some gloves. 
and we'll be reusing this so don't don't discard this and kind of remember how it's in there it's basically just filling up the cabinet and it looks like we have the point to point version so what I'm going to do here is pull these four screws, two on the top, two on the bottom, and we should be able to pull this whole plate out. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, the two black, or black and red wire here is the main feed from the terminals on the back, and I think we're gonna need to undo some, some nuts that connect to that that terminal. So I'm just going to pull this away. Oh, no, it's all on here. So that's the whole crossover plate pulled. Feb 21, 1989. Very cool. We just need to disconnect the other drivers and this crossover should be free. So we've got a black and a yellow here. These are pretty long, so I'm assuming this goes up to the tweeter. What's this here? White. So, so far we had black and red going to the woofer. We've got a white wire and I think the black wire is shared. That white wire enters the sub cavity here. So this is gonna be for the mid range. And then the yellow is going to be for the tweeter. So I just need to undo this wire nut. And if we look at the wire back there, it's the red wire from the tweeter coming into the yellow here. It's free, this one here. So most of the colors are pretty straightforward except for that tweeter on the yellow. And then does this have its own ground? The tweeter has its own ground connection. The mid-range and the base are shared. So I need to make sure that these stay together. I'm just gonna twist this for my own sanity. And now that those wires are free, we should be able to pull the tweeter and test that. I'm curious if it's going to go all the way up. And then the other thing that I can do is I can do a frequency response test on this crossover itself as well. All right, so let's get this out of the way. Let's pull this tweeter. And underneath these, there's going to be a gasket, but it's made out of a foam that's going to be deteriorating pretty bad. We can kind of see it here just turning to powder. So this gasket will need to get replaced. These ones, because they have a uh, grill on it, it's much safer to pull this with a power tool. I just try to avoid it on the big woofer. rocking this back and forth. Is that stuck in there? There it goes. January 1969. Is that missing? Why or not? And we're out. So we'll be able to test that out of the out of the box and test the crossover. I'm pretty sure the mid ranges are fine. I will need to pull these eventually. Looks like this is some sort of compressed um, like cardboard or like masonite or something. We'll probably end up replacing that as well. So I have the tweeter from that cabinet pulled. And usually what happens is when you find a KLH5 in the wild, if you plug it in, it's gonna sound pretty bad, um, usually because the, the tweeter stopped working. And it's not usually the tweeter itself, it's usually in the crossover. So let's just do a quick Ohm's reading across the voice coil. 
and that's that's completely fine. This this tweeter is going to be okay. Um, but just to make sure, let's let's run an audio signal through it. So I'm just going to test with a five kilohertz sine wave. I don't want to feed full frequency into this because if you put low frequency in, into a tweeter, it can uh, damage it if the amplitude's too high. So I'm just going to feed a five kilohertz sine wave in. We'll see if it works. That's a nice clean uh, sine wave. So this tweeter is good. Um, next, we'll check out the crossover plate itself and see if there's any issues there. So now that we've confirmed that the tweeter itself is okay, I want to inspect this crossover and see if there's been a component failure that's causing the, the high frequencies not to pass. So the way that I'm gonna do this is we're gonna feed a noise signal from my function generator into my bench amplifier. And right now what the signal sounds like going through a full range speaker is like that. We're going to feed that same signal let's see, into the back of the crossover plate. So I've got ground and eight ohms here going into the bench amplifier. And then we're just gonna connect up to the speaker and see what we get. So the this is the mid-range and the woofer connections, and then the tweeter connections are over on this side. So let's start from the bottom and build our way up. Connect the ground connection here, and the red one is the woofer. Okay, I'm just gonna raise the volume on the amp. So that is the low frequency portion working. Let's switch this over to the white wire, which is mid-range. You see the noise is there, but the pitch is slightly changed. And now I don't need to pull the black wire from the tweeter because it's all common. That wire is just there for convenience. So I just need to connect my yellow here. Now I'm raising the audio on the amp. I'm at about the same level that I tested the other two sections at, and I have no output from my test speaker. So something has failed on this board and it's, um, it's causing the, the frequencies that are um, supposed to be going to the tweeter to not pass through the crossover network. So let's dive in and see which one of these parts has failed. So generally on a, on a crossover, if there's been a resistor failure, you're gonna, see, um, you're gonna see some char marks. You might see a, a resistor that's cracked or something like that. I don't see any of this here. So it's almost certainly going to be a capacitor failure. So I'm gonna start with my uh, in circuit peak tester here, but I doubt I'm gonna be able to get conclusive test results in circuit. Let's just try a couple. That one seemed to test fine, but I don't think that value is actually supposed to be that high. That one's showing high ESR. Let's go down to one of these. So this guy in here is coming here and here. Yeah, in circuit leaky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, snip all of these capacitors out and strip the leads so that we can properly test them. Um, I have a untouched second crossover, which will be my reference point. So I don't mind kind of hacking one of these up to do the test because this is gonna get all rebuilt anyways. But I do wanna keep one intact uh, for a reference. Okay, I've stripped and prepped all of these connections. I just have them kind of twisted into position just so that I can test them one at a time and put them back in. So we're gonna be retesting this after we figure out what's wrong with it. Okay, I'm gonna start up here. So I'm just undoing one of the leads. So this is supposed to be 25 microfarad. And that's measuring a little bit high. In a crossover network, we generally want to be pretty accurate so that we get the, the cutoff frequency and the slope to be correct. Um, but it's not enough to keep this thing from working. And also that's probably in the woofer section. So. Let's do this one. This one's supposed to be 16. Close enough. All right, let's do this one. That was supposed to be three microfarads, so that is not causing any issues. OK. 
Okay, let's go for this one. This way we can see the meter. Wow, so far all of them are testing at least with some capacitance, no opens or shorts or anything yet. So that really just leaves this one. So this says black com negative. So this is gonna be two capacitors in one. Let's see, this is two X four microfarad. So in between black and each of these leads, we should have four microfarad. That reading there is from the previous capacitor. This is not even registering that there's capacitance there. I think this guy's completely open. So let me find um, some substitution caps and we will sub something in and see if we can get this thing running again. So I don't have any four microfarad in stock, but I have some uh, 4.7 microfarad films and this will be fine for an initial test. So if I do the same test on these, that's where we're at. So what I'm going to do is hook these up with clip leads into where uh, this one was. So let's start out with a ground connection or a common connection, which um, this used to be connected down here on this terminal. So I'll connect that to one end of this cap. And then I'm just going to clip on right there for common on the second capacitor. And then we just need to connect to these other two points. So I've got this one here. So that replaces one section and the other comes down here to replace this one. Okay, so that's the substitution. And now let's uh, connect the amplifier again. Fire. And instead of going to the crossover plate, I know that those terminals come right to these two points here. So I'm just going to connect right on the crossover board here. Just do a quick double check. Okay. And then for the speaker test, I'm on the, the tweeter connection here. Let's fire up the amp. Whoops. Got my hopes up. There we go. Initially I was coming out of my bench speaker, but this is indeed coming out of the tweeter wires. So before we move on to rebuilding this thing, I thought it'd be interesting to do a frequency response test. So I've got a rat's nest of cables here. I've got three eight ohm dummy loads hooked up and I'm monitoring them on the oscilloscope while I'm doing a Bode plot. So right now this is plotting the frequency response and phase of each, um, each one of the outputs of this crossover network. And we're gonna see what it looks like graphically. Um, this isn't super accurate because not all of these drivers are eight ohms. So we're going to eight ohm resistive load, but it'll give us a general idea of what's happening with this crossover. So once this plot finishes, I will zoom into it and we'll take a look. All right, we are looking at a plot of frequency versus amplitude for the three outputs of this crossover network. So I swept it from 20 hertz to 30 kilohertz. The yellow trace is the low frequency, blue trace is the, the tweeter, and the green trace is the mid-range. So what we can see is the, um, the tweeter is, sorry, the woofer is very flat all the way till about one kilohertz, and then it has this um, roll off here. The tweeter does basically the opposite. It stays very low until it gets to, I don't know, it starts ramping up closer to one kilohertz and then comes through. So that's, you know, the, the crossover point there between those two. Then it looks like what the mid-range is doing is just filling in a little bit of that transition there. So that's, uh, you know, fundamentally this crossover is working now with these substituted parts. Um, I guess uh, we can do this, repeat this test after it's rebuilt and see if there's anything that looks a little bit different. Okay, I'm gonna start by gutting this entire board. The only thing that's going to remain are the switches, the coils and uh, terminal strips and their wiring. All the capacitors and resistors are gonna come off. Realistically, the resistors are 
um, probably all going to be fine. But I need to clean up these posts anyways to mount the new parts. So I figure I'm going to put new resistors in anyways, and we'll call this an, an upgrade. Um, so I'm going to get started with clearing this one off and um, come back when it's ready to repopulate. This crossover plate has now been gutted, so no more resistors or capacitors on here. So that's what I'm going to be rebuilding next. And then I'm gonna use this one as a reference as I go to make sure I get all the parts back in the correct spots. Now I've ordered all of the parts for this from Parts Express. I usually order all my parts on Mauser or, or DigiKey, but a lot of times the specific crossover values like four microfarad or something, they just don't make because it's not a it's not a common value. So at um at Parts Express we can get high grade polypropylene caps and you know exact values like four microfarad. You also have some really nice resistors with long leads. These will really help in mounting. I just completed the first crossover rebuild. So this turned out really nice. I did want to go over some changes that I made to the original wiring scheme, uh, just in case anyone's following along so you don't get confused at what I did. So um, I've just gone and checked and made sure that all my connections are, are correct. One of the things to point out here on the big 25 microfarad cap, the factory connection is, let's see which one this is. It's this guy here. And we can see that one of the connections goes to this lug, which comes back to here. It's basically just um, this needed a spot to come to ground, so they jumped it over here. 
what I did to so that I didn't have to um, splice wires onto this capacitor is I've just linked um, this connection up here instead. So it's the same electronically, it's just a shorter path for the capacitor. It's not for some sort of audio improvement, it's just that it made it so that I didn't have to do an extension of the, of the leads like I did on some of these other caps. And then in the original circuit, there's uh, four capacitor sections here technically, two singles and one double capacitor. So instead of doing those all underneath the zip tie here, I just did two four microfarads and a three microfarad, and then I've got the other four microfarad um, piggybacked out here. So that's pretty much it for the changes, I guess. Um, when I do this one, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how I prepped uh, the capacitors for these sections here, um, because it's probably a little bit hard to see on the, on the time-lapse overhead shot. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to hook this up and do the frequency response test on it and see how it compares to the, um, the original test that we did. This is what the Bode plot looks like after the crossover has been completely rebuilt. And this is with the control set to flat. So later on, we'll look at what happens to this curve as we adjust the various adjustments on the back of the crossover. But overall, it's looking very similar to the original measurement with the exception of the green trace, which is the mid-range, which seems to be um, more elevated after the rebuild, which I guess may result in a smoother, um, smoother transition between those two drivers. All right, let's move on with rebuilding the second board, and I'll go into some more detail on, on the rebuild process. Before I rebuild the second board, I wanted to do a little bit of prep work so that um, everything kind of looks the same between the two. So, the things that I'm going to prep in advance are uh, this capacitor. I'm going to solder some leads to it. Now, in the past, what I've done is uh, had the leads full length, and then I would solder a wire onto it and put a piece of heat shrink on to cover up the joint. But after thinking about it, it's much better if I use a piece of wire and just come right to the end of the capacitor. So you can see what I've, what I've done here is uh, soldered a wire to each side of this capacitor so that it's insulated and it goes all the way where it needs to go. I also need to do that on this three microfarad, and then I'm going to put these two four microfarad caps together on one side with a common lead. So let's start with the, with the four microfarad capacitors. So what we're doing is replacing this two section can. So imagine that this black lead is where these caps are going to come together and touch and do a common point, and then this is the other lead from each one that's gonna be facing out the front. So <clears throat> what I do is just get the capacitors and roughly an orientation where the labels can be seen from the top. And then it's going to be going this way. So the lead ends up coming out of the second capacitor back to here. So what I'm going to do is just straighten this out. And then give it a bend. And then when I get over to this part, I just need to loop this around. So I've created a little, a little loop here, and then I'm just going to solder right on that joint, and then we'll trim it up. on camera is a bit tough. There we go. All right, so now this capacitor has a common lead. Where's my cutters? I'm just going to snip this extra. And then in the end, this part will come over and that's what will make contact with the terminal. And these will you know, go to their respective points. So that's the prep for the two four microfarad capacitors. And now I want to just extend the leads on one side of the three microfarad. Where did that go? Oh, it is this one. So this is my three microfarad capacitor. And that one's going to end up going on top of this, this way, but this lead is not long enough for it to reach its point here. So I'm gonna do something similar to that, but I'm just gonna be adding a wire to make this lead extra long. So my preference is solid core for this. So I've just got some solid core hookup wire here. This is going to be 20 gauge, I believe, which is fine. It's similar to the gauge of the lead itself here. So I'm just gonna snip a piece of this off 
enough to get me to where I'm going here. I'll just prep this with a, looks like some of this insulator slipped back a little bit. Trim this hair. Okay, it's gonna be sitting in this way, so I need to put the lead on this side. And so I just made like a little a U shape here. I'm just gonna squeeze that in. Easier said than done, I guess. And I'll just kind of bend that back the other way. So I should be able to solder that. Just sit it down somewhere where I can get the iron on it. Now you want to keep the dwell time short on here so that we don't damage the, the plastic. So I've just got a little this tin just a little bit here. Get this out of the way. Got some more room to work. Now we can see I'm right at the end of this capacitor with an extended lead, and then I just need to trim off the original lead. So now this capacitor will be able to reach back to its tie point on that strip and, and up here on the other crossover. So that prep is done. And then I need to do the same thing on, on this one. This capacitor has slightly bigger leads on it. Slightly thicker, I should say. Um, so I'm going to up it to 18 gauge solid core wire. 22 is probably or 20 is probably fine for everything, but this is a thicker wire coming out of the cap, so I'm just going to maintain that. And um, yeah, so let me get those prepped. And this I need it to be long enough that I can loop around the back and come here and and that way. So since I already have this one done, I can kind of estimate. I should be pointing for that side. orientation so same thing I'm gonna make a little u-shape here come on to the capacitor fairly close to the end just gonna crimp down that u So there's one side done. And this wire can be a little bit shorter, and of course I'll, I'll be trimming it to length when I actually do the assembly. Something around there is fine. And that's the prep work. So now we can get on with rebuilding that second board, and then this one is now going to be my reference because I've confirmed everything's working properly, so I just have to make the other one look like this and the crossovers will be done. So I've got the resistors done on this board. Um, I do those first because they're kind of the bottom layer and there's a lot of crisscrossing wires and stuff that go on top of some of them, so it's better to get those out of the way. So all the resistors are done. The only thing to note is I couldn't get a 5 ohm, so I did a 5.1 ohm, but that should be within, within tolerance. They measure pretty darn close to the original. So otherwise the, the values are all the same on those. Next I'm going to move on to the capacitors. And for these, this is the 25 microfarad one, and what I've done is just added some uh, Teflon tubing. You can use heat shrink for this. The main thing is just on, on stuff like this here where you have things crossing that, that it gets used so you don't end up shorting uh, one of the connections out and creating a filter that you're not supposed to. So on this one, I've kind of prepped my leads. We already did the extended leads on the 16 microfarad one. So what I'll do is twist this so it comes down the side because I'm going to put this all inside of a uh, zip tie here. So these are going to go side by side like this. We'll zip tie them in and then I'll complete the connections. 
For the zip tie, I like the look of just a strap coming across, so I try to line it up so that um, this, this part of the zip tie is underneath the plate. I mean, it doesn't really matter. This is all going to be hidden anyways, but if I can get this started into this hole here. So now I can line the end up underneath this hole and then I can strap my capacitors in here. Now I have uh, opened up this solder connection for the ground here and kind of tilted it up out of the way so that I can get a little extra space for this guy. So I'm just going to dry fit these in. I'll get a loop started here. Okay, that's it. I started. Got to make sure the uh, values are showing. Let me try to match that up to my other one for height. Looks like I was right below this. Add a little back. Okay. Let's make sure this is going to reach. That will. All right. So that's kind of where I want those to sit. I'm going to go ahead and tighten this down. So then on this one, I'm just going to bend this connection over this way. And it's just going to end up getting connected right here. Again, that's just moving this ground connection over. And then the rest is kind of self-explanatory, just connecting these sections up to where they were before. Okay, I've prepped this little section here. So luckily I was able to copy my lengths of Teflon there so everything can be prepped in advance. This is the one that got tied together and that's the three microfarad. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the zip tie here. Let's see how we get this one. There. Okay, so that's that set in place. I just need to solder in these connections and then the last cap goes um, down here.
Okay, both crossover boards are rebuilt to the same specification. And um, before I do the final testing, I'm going to clean these controls. So these ones are pretty easy. I'm gonna use Deoxit D100 um, just because the spray stuff makes a mess. If you just have regular Deoxit D5, that's fine. If that's the case, you just put some paper towels or something around here so you don't get um, Deoxit all over the thing. So I'm just going to take this D100 and put a couple drops in these holes here. This is for metal on metal contacts, which these are. And then I just need to manipulate the controls on the back. This is the second uh, crossover board, all wired up. And here's our Bodhi plot results. And they are extremely similar to the other crossover. This point where the, the green trace comes across is right, right at that cross point. So everything is looking good. I'm pretty much identical on both of these boards. Next up, I'm going to run a plot with the controls in various positions, and we'll see how this changes the, um, the plot. Okay, so what I've done here is taken the high control and just rotated it to the high position. So this is above 7,000 CPS, cycles per second, above 7,000 hertz. So I've moved this from the middle position to high and then ran the plot again. And what we can see is that on the blue trace, we've come almost level with the, uh, with the low frequency trace. And what I remember the last time that I worked on one of these is that this is a, a diagram that somebody at Classic Speaker Pages had uh, posted of how the crossover works. Oops, I have this upside down. Um, the woofer and the mid ranges are basically just fixed filters, and all of those controls work on the uh, tweeter curve. So that's what the plot looks like for the 7000 CPS control. Let's take the 2500 to 7000 CPS and put that in the low position and see what that does. Here's the result for that change. So you can see that the, the line is smoothed down in this area, so there's less of a, um, of a slope here. So let's do the exact opposite of that and let's uh, cut the, low, the highs and, um, and boost the lows. And what I would expect is that this is gonna jump and this will come down, so we'll end up with a curve that looks something like that. All right, this is the final plot. This is with the uh, 2500 to 7000 in the high position and the 7000 and up in the low position. We can see the blue trace has come way down relative to the woofer. Um, and then it's a little bit boosted here to where the blue line is coming over uh, the green line there. So that's how the, the tone control works on this or the, the adjustments on the back. It only affects the tweeter. And um, that, that's gonna conclude this video. It's getting quite long, so I'm gonna cut it here and we'll do a second part that will focus on the, um, the actual cabinet repair, loading the drivers and the crossovers and everything else. So thanks for stopping by the channel. If you enjoyed this content, I would encourage you to subscribe and, and keep coming back and we will catch you on the next one.